appreciate it. Thank you for letting me be a part of the, the webinar again this year and for letting me talk about what I think is gonna be a very important insect in our state here in the very near future, unfortunately. It's this handsome devil, this thing is called the spotted lanternfly. If you've heard me talk at some of the updates and things over the last year or year and a half, you know that I've been kind of pumping this one up. It's something that's going to be a big deal once it does arrive in the state. So we want everybody be, to be prepared and we want everybody to know what to be on the lookout for when it comes to this pest. Just some background biology and kind of invasive species history with this. The spotted lanternfly was first confirmed in Pennsylvania in 2014. That was the first North American find. It was probably introduced in around 2012, they think, and it probably came in on infected nursery stock. Uh, here in a little bit, we'll show some of the eggs of this pest, and it's most likely that the eggs of it were, were on some infected nursery stock that was accidentally shipped over uh, and then kind of unloaded and put into a nursery there in Pennsylvania. They were allowed to hatch, and from there, they were able to start a small infestation and get going. Its native range is in Asia, which is something that we say for a lot of our invasive species. Uh, many of the pests that we deal with from that area, they find our climate very habitable. <clears throat> they find that uh, there's lots of food here to eat. With invasive species, they're able to survive because there's nothing really attacking them in a lot of cases. Uh, but there's a lot to do with weather and climate. They have to find something that's similar to their native range. And we in the Eastern United States share a lot of climatic factors uh, with East Asia in particular. So if we look at the lanternfly and some of the problems that it can cause, it does feed on over 70 different host species. It prefers to feed on trees most often, uh, in particular, the tree of heaven. That's its main host. They will also feed on white pines. They'll feed on maple trees uh, and quite a few other hardwood species. When they feed on them, they can cause some damage. They can cause sap oozing and wounds on the tree. Uh, the tree will smell kind of fermented, and we'll talk more about that here in a second. Uh, but that's what they're usually doing. When they're younger, they'll feed on lots more of uh, food hosts. But as they age, they start to prioritize feeding on the tree of heaven. So once they reach adulthood, that's what they tend to prefer to feed on. Uh, as they develop, they will also attack fruits in some cases. They will attack some vegetable crops. Uh, but some of the big things they attack include hops and then vineyards. Uh, they get on grapevines. They also love wild grape. So if you look in the forests where these infestations are, you'll see them on some trees, but also on these sort of weedy shrubs that are around. But if you go to a vineyard that's infested, uh, you'll notice them up and down some of the vines like we see here, plugged in and feeding. If we look at the map of this pest, it has spread from Pennsylvania into several other states. It started seeping into New Jersey and New York. It's also in Delaware and Maryland. It's gotten down into the Virginias as well. You can see a couple of hot spots uh, in Northern Virginia and then also in West Virginia. One interesting thing that I've learned from some colleagues at Penn State who are sort of the national leaders on this pest just because uh, it, it ended up in their backyard first is that their state, they enacted a very strict quarantine and it's been fairly successful. You can see this has been there for probably a decade uh, it's been confirmed there for under a decade, but it's probably been there hiding for over a decade. And it's not in the entire state yet. Uh, the only sort of noticeable failure, if you look at the state, is this straight line of counties that goes east uh, or goes from east to west. And those are counties that contain a rail line, actually. And they found out that there was a railroad that was working through here and they were sort of accidentally transporting the spotted lantern fly across the state like that. Uh, so they had to even toughen up on that uh, and try and enact some fines there. There are two counties in Ohio that have been impacted. One of them is up in Cleveland. And then the westernmost point that it's been discovered and confirmed thus far is here in southern Indiana in Switzerland County. This is an interesting situation. It was an interesting find. We got called to come and look at it last summer. Uh, so Rick Besson and myself went with the Office of the State Entomologist. The Office of the State Entomologist in our state is housed in our department. This is very different from other states and they're sort of the regulatory arm. So they get involved with a lot of invasive species and the Indiana folks wanted them to come and take a look because this was only about three miles, two to three miles from the Kentucky state line. Uh, you can see, if you look online, there's lots of cool news reports that were about this. Uh, it was found in this Southern County right on the river 
Uh, we got to go to Switzerland County. This is a picture from the park that we went to. Uh, Switzerland County is apparently very famous for their Swiss wine festival that they hold in Vevey, Indiana. So a little bit of uh, tourism promotion for Switzerland County here today. Uh, I don't want to talk bad about them just because they got luck unlucky and had this one bug show up. Uh, it is a very beautiful looking area. There's this large dam, uh, Markland Dam, that also is housed in this park, Markland Dam Park. That's where we met with the Indiana DNR, the Department of Natural Resources folks, and they took us to the infested site. Uh, it was quite a large infestation. It was found on some private property and the man had discovered a nymph on his front porch. And then when he had the DNR come out, they went into his woods and they discovered that there was an established infestation, which means that there are eggs and multiple life stages present. So this is right across the line. Uh, it's right across the street from Ghent and you can see Warsaw, Kentucky here, Sparta, Kentucky, a little further away. Uh, this is something that was very near to us. It was a little frightening to be able to look out and just see Kentucky on the other side to see that there were multiple bridges where people could be going across and accidentally transporting this pest. You'll also find that people uh, online talk about this other find that may be the new furthest west find, which was in Kansas. <clears throat> this was in Thomas County, Kansas, which is in western Kansas, so pretty far away. And it was actually interesting. It involved a 4-H'er. And so a student 4-H'er uh, made his insect collection and brought it in for the fair. And when he turned it in, the judge noticed that there was a spotted lanternfly in it. They asked him how he had collected that. And he informed them of where he found it. They went, they've done an, an inspection. They couldn't find anything. They couldn't find any established invaders. It's thought that this could have just been a one-off, that maybe it fell off of a truck or uh, a hiker or somebody accidentally brought it back and it just fell off and the student accidentally collected it. But I thought that was kind of an interesting story, the power of 4-H, uh, the potential for it to have actually caught this invasive species before anybody else. So uh, that is not an established find yet. They haven't found any others in Kansas. They're monitoring, but thus far, this what the most Western find is the one in Switzerland County. Other biology uh, factoids about this pest, it's a hemipteran, which means that it's a true bug. True bugs are a special group of insects. They're separate from things like the beetles and the moths and butterflies and others. And they're separated out because of some uh, physical adaptations that they have. It's a very diverse group. It used to be two orders itself, but it's actually been merged together. So it now contains all of the cicadas, the stink bugs, the aphids, things like bed bugs and bat bugs as well as plant hoppers and tree hoppers and scale insects. All of these, despite looking kind of radically different, uh, are united by a few traits. The, the plant hopper group that the spotted lanternfly is a part of is known as the fulgorid plant hoppers. They are also known just as the lanternflies, which is how this insect gets its common name. This is a really tropical group. We only have two species that live in Kentucky, and they're very small, like you see on the right here these really tiny kind of brown colored insects that are able to jump and fly with their wings. They are very powerful jumpers. There are other extravagant species in this group. Uh, this is the peanut headed bug or alligator bug that you see on the left. They have this head adaptation where it actually kind of looks like a toothy alligator or crocodile. Uh, there are others that have really big horns that po poke out the front. Some of them have really long wool that grows out the back. Uh, it's quite an interesting tropical group, but the, the ones that live here that are native are very brown and very boring. If you look, this is a one that was in action when we were in Indiana, and I think it shows you some of the special traits of this plant hopper group. They're very fast. They walk quickly. They have long legs, typically. I hope the video was, was showing well enough for everybody to see, uh, but basically they can move really quickly. And if you disturb them, they're able to jump backwards and unfold their wings. It's all very rapid. Uh, they tend to take off very quickly and they're hard to grab because of that. Go to the next slide. Just some of the traits that make all of these part of the hemipteran group that make them these true bugs. One is their needle-like mouth part. If we look at the aphid on the left there, you can see it plugged into the plant. If we look on the right, whoops, my computer has got a mind of its own. All of a sudden, you can see uh, their needle is highlighted by this oval. It's tucked up under the head so that they can feed with it when they want and, and can kind of protect it when they're not using it. 
but this ensures that all members of this group of this order, they have an all liquid diet. So it's either plant sap or chlorophytic material they're kind of sucking out of the plant or in the case of bird bugs and bat bugs and bed bugs, it'll be blood, but it's always a liquid with this group. They also develop through what we call incomplete metamorphosis. With incomplete metamorphosis, we have eggs that then hatch and out of the eggs will come nymphs Nymphs are in the immature form, part of this life cycle. They will gradually grow. With nymphal development, you look vaguely similar to your adult form usually. You're usually kind of the same shape, but you're just small and you have wing buds on your back that will gradually develop into full wings. Once you get your wings, you are a full-fledged adult in the insect world. There are no baby bugs that have wings. Once you get those wings, you're a captain and you're an adult basically. Uh, but they go through this nymphal development. You see this with aphids, you see it with bed bugs and other members of their order. Specifically with this species, their life cycle is uh, one generation a year, which is very helpful when you have an invasive species. That means you're not getting pressured constantly uh, throughout the season. They overwinter as eggs. The eggs have some special adaptations we'll talk about in a moment that make them a successful overwintering stage. But you can see them from September of one year into June of the next year. Uh, they will hatch as early as April. So here in the next couple of weeks, we'll probably start to see the eggs in Indiana hatch. And from those hatchings, we will see these first instar nymphs. They're present anytime between April and June. Uh, after that, they will develop into the second instar, which is usually around at the height of the summer into July. As summer starts to wane and we go into the end of July, we see the third instar. And you'll just notice that they're getting gradually bigger but they stay black with white dots for the early part of their life. As we enter into the late summer, into July, August, and September, we see the fourth instar, which gets these red war paint streaks on it. And then they will develop into adulthood over the July to December timeframe, which is when we see them present. And they're mating and laying eggs from September into December. So they do survive pretty far into the year and they're laying eggs uh, for a lot of the fall and early part of winter, which will then survive to go into the next year to start the whole cycle over again. This pest has several attributes that I think make it such as a successful invasive species. One is their eggs. So the eggs are laid on any hard surface. They can be laid on vines and tree trunks like we see on the far left here. They can also be put on uh, fence posts and sign posts. They can be put onto mailboxes, any unnatural object. They'll also use stones. Uh, they put them on houses, lawn furniture, like we see on the right here, anything basically. They'll even use cars and trains and planes uh, and automobiles, all those different things as egg laying surfaces. The other thing about the egg patches that you see here is that this is an individual egg, luckily. Uh, it's not that big, but it's something that contains quite a few individuals. So underneath of this mud smear that you see here, there's usually around 37 eggs. Uh, it can get up to the high 70s, above 75, almost approaching 80 eggs underneath each of these. The egg masses, when they hatch, they look like these old coin purses that you see on the left here. Uh, they are pretty distinct. They look different than other eggs because they're all lined up in a line. Uh, other people have told me they think they look like black eyed peas uh, or just like a split pea. Uh, they're just this open container that's kind of sitting on the plant. There's nothing covering them. When the female first makes the egg mass, she's going to cover it with this white goo that you see here. And then that goo is going to harden over time and cure into this kind of brown khaki color. And that epoxy, this goo that they put there is actually present for a good reason. The female makes this epoxy with her body. She squirts it out on top of the eggs, and then they're protected for the winter. It gives them uh, the ability to survive the air temperatures because they're protected by this material. And they have noticed in Pennsylvania that uncoated eggs survive at a lower rate than the coated eggs. You'll notice if we go back a couple of pictures here, not all of the eggs get covered. She will leave some uncovered either on accident or she's intercepted or eaten, or maybe she just runs out of the material or time. But those eggs that are outside of the epoxy, they can survive, but they don't do it as a, at high of a rate as they do if they get the white coating on them. So that's one thing that helps them to be so successful. They also have very few natural enemies. When we look here in the United States, uh, in their native range, there are things that lay their eggs. 
inside of the eggs of spotted lanternfly. There's a few things that eat them there. This is one thing that's kind of allowed them to be so successful in places of agriculture like you see here. So here's an orchard where we see a tree that's more bug than tree at this point. That's not to say that nothing will eat them here. Uh, they have been observed being consumed by multiple species here in the United States. Uh, one thing that will eat them frequently are mantids. So here on the left, we see an adult mantid chowing down, taking some big nibbles out of a spotted lanternfly. I would point out that this is probably a Chinese mantis. Uh, so it's possible that this is sort of like a, a back home rivalry. Uh, they may have known each other once in their native range and consume them uh, there. So it stands to reason that they're able to do it here. But we do have some native spiders. This is the black and yellow argiope that you see on the right. Uh, we were talking and joking about the Joro spider before we got started, but this is a spider species that resembles this invasive Joro spider that's been in the news a lot lately, but it is a native species. Uh, and they will feed on the lanternflies if they get caught in their web. People have noticed wheel bugs attacking them. Uh, lots of others will attack them and eat them. Uh, there's been reports of chickens consuming them when they get into chicken pens. Uh, I read one thing about garter snakes using them, but it wasn't from an EDU or uh, an extension publication. So I don't know if that's been verified. Uh, and there's also discussions online of people watching yellow jackets eat them. Uh, that yellow jackets will show up and either sting them and attempt to consume them, or they were picking apart their, their bodies. They were scavenging on them. So there are things that eat them, but it's just not at a high enough rate to suppress those populations naturally for us so we don't have to deal with this. It's, not also, it's also not just a crop pest. It's similar to the brown marmorated stink bug in that they become a nuisance pest, particularly into the winter. Uh, the adults can sometimes end up in homes they don't survive in the home. They can't overwinter there like the brown marmorated stink bug does. If you look on the right there, that's a fireplace. That's all brown or that's all spotted lanternfly kind of laying around on the bottom there. Uh, they get inside and they die. They can't survive. The stink bugs, you know, they find a place to kind of hide out and overwinter. The lanternfly can't do that, luckily. Uh, I would hate to be brushing my teeth one morning and have one of them fall down and hit me in the face on January 2nd or something. Uh, the other big thing I would point out is that a lot of people in Pennsylvania where this has gone uh, big time, where it's in all those different counties, uh, they talk about how impactful this is just on their day-to-day -day life. Backyard activities are typically ruined. Kids can't use their play equipment anymore because there's just so many bugs that are on the trees with their swings, or they just don't want to be around it. It's a, a smelly mess when these insects invade. It's annoying. It's It's drastic. And so a lot of people online in Facebook forums and places like that, they report not having barbecues anymore, basically just staying inside, trying to avoid the lantern flies. Here's just a short gif of a guy going up to his tree in his backyard, knocking them off with his hand. This might be nightmare fuel for some of you. I mean, that's a lot of bugs. You can see how annoying that could be if you were in your backyard and these were just kind of pinging off that tree and hitting you in the face. Uh, if you were a kid and you were wanting to play over there, that's a weird thing to be exposed to. It's not a lot of fun for people when this gets into their backyard. The other thing they do is they excrete a lot of sugar water waste. As they feed, they use their needle-like mouth part to pull out the plant sap. And when they do that, uh, they digest it. It's not very nutritious. The feeding uh, style that these insects have means that they produce a lot of sugary waste, which we call honeydew. The honeydew accumulates on the leaves and trunks of the plants that they're feeding on. It also gets on the ground around them. Uh, it can attract stinging insects. It can attract sooty mold. And it smells very fermented, I would say. Uh, it smells kind of like an old distillery. I've got another video. Let me know if it's not showing up real well uh, in the chat. And I can try to reshare my screen. But this is just the infestation that we were at in Indiana. And if you look at these plants, all of these wild plants that were underneath these trees, I mean, they're just coated in sooty mold. It was everywhere. It smelled really rank. Um, there were bees and flies everywhere. The air literally hummed with activity from those insects. They want to drink this sugary butt juice up. It's a food item for them. Uh, we see this with aphids and other species that produce honeydew. The ants, the bees, the wasps, they want to get at it and drink it. And this is actually a huge issue in Pennsylvania where there's so many lantern flies and so much honeydew that there's been recordings of bees switching from foraging on flowers to essentially just harvesting this honeydew. And then it spoils the honey 
that the beekeepers want to harvest from those bees because it's just all fecal material. It's not actually any nectar that went into it. So it's foul and bitter and nasty. Uh, this is, has lo lots of far reaching consequences, this feeding style and this honeydew. One other thing to point out is that people have fallen because of this. It coats stairs, it coats decks, it's very slippery. And so people bowl over and people have broken bones because of this. So I think it's just showing you that there's gonna be a lot of quality of life impacts from this pest. This is another video that shows you how they make the honeydew. Uh, I'll just let it play here. I think watch this one that's nearest the grape and you can see how they make so much of it so quickly. <clears throat> it kind of comes out like a fire hose almost. It's, it's very different from aphids and others. If you look, it's just like coming out like a garden hose or a sprinkler almost. Uh, it's just a lot of honeydew and there's lots of bugs that are making honeydew and it, develop, it, it builds up quite rapidly and becomes very annoying. Here in Kentucky, there are some things that we're trying to teach people about. We hope people will be on the lookout for trees of heaven in their area. Tree of heaven is an invasive species in of itself. It's also problematic. People still plant it though. Uh, we're still getting a good handle on where, every, uh, uh, where the tree of heaven thrives the most in Kentucky. I know there are some folks with records of this, and I know that there are people that may have planted it in the past. But those are the areas that we need to be looking at as potential first invasion sites for lanternfly. They do prefer to feed on this tree, as I said, uh, as they develop. It's the one that they want to feed on. They have not a coevolution, but a very close relationship where the chemical defenses that this plant has, they do confer upon the insect in, in a small fashion. And so because of that, uh, this is really the tree that we're kind of on the lookout for. It has those really ornate looking leaves, uh, the compound leaves that you see here, kind of these golden paddles uh, as the seed pods, and then the cantaloupe looking skin uh, for the bark. And these all help us to identify this. We are starting a citizen science project through the entomology department and the office of the state entomologist, where we will be hopefully recruiting master naturalists and master gardeners uh, to work with county agents. We'll start with the agents first, of course, talking about this. Uh, and setting things up, but there's an app that the Office of the State Entomologist has uh, kind of co-developed where people can report Tree of Heaven across the state, and we'll be able to prioritize the, those spots and make a map and really kind of figure out where we need to be looking for lanternfly first and foremost. In the future, you need to be aware that any Trees of Heaven that you do see could end up becoming traps that are used for monitoring for this pest. In a lot of cases, that will be sticky band trapping, you may see these trees that look like they all of a sudden they have a pantyhose on or something like they've got these armbands or something wrapped around them. And it's this sticky glue board that's been wrapped around them. Uh, a lot of uh, stickum applied to this, uh, this material that's wrapped around the tree. And then as the insect crawls up or climbs onto the tree, they'll get stuck in the band and we can use that as a monitoring tool. There is always some pushback when this gets implemented on a wide scale because sticky band traps can be very indiscriminate in what they snare, unfortunately. These are two images from news stories I found in Pennsylvania about what happens to birds in Pennsylvania. So we've got a woodpecker on one side. I'm not a bird expert, so I don't know the one on the right, but the birds frequently try to eat the bugs that are stuck on here, and then their wings get stuck and they die stuck to the trap. Uh, it's very upsetting for people to discover this, and uh, especially when we're talking about birds, which people think are very beautiful or some of them are protected, uh, songbirds and things like that. And then woodpeckers, I mean, uh, some of those are endangered. So these sticky band traps may not be the way we go automatically in the state of Kentucky. In fact, right now, if you go to Northern Kentucky, you won't find any of those traps, but you will find this bag and screen trap, which will be hung in trees. I will be honest, it looks like a really uh, low rent version of a bagpipe and that it, they're just kind of like bungee corded to trees. It looks very strange. Uh, and some people think that it's garbage and they try to rip it out or people think it's some sort of like cultish thing uh, that's like a symbol, but it really is a trap. The insects will crawl up the wood stakes and then they get into the bag on top and there's either something in there that kills them or the heat will suffocate them eventually. Uh, and we're able to check these pretty quickly. Uh, these have been hung up in Northern Kentucky you can drive around and see them along the Ohio River uh, in certain areas. And we're just hopeful that we can get more of those implemented and keep track of this pest as it tries to invade our state. 
We may also notice that there are trees of heaven that get turned into trap trees through insecticidal treatments. With trap treeing, what we do is we go in an area where there's lots of trees of heaven and they cut down all the small ones, but they leave three or four big ones there. And then the lanternflies will be forced to feed on those trees that are left. And they inject those trees with an insecticide, typically dinotefuron. And then when they feed on that tree, they're all killed. You can see a treated tree over here with dead ones below and then sort of unsuspecting feeders still on the plant acquiring a lethal dose of that insecticide. This works really well. It's very helpful in culling parts of the population. And it's something that we're hopeful we'll be doing in Kentucky. Kentucky does have the potential to participate in this and in a fashion that's a little stronger than other states. We were able to work with a company last year to set up an emergency label, a 24C label through the Kentucky Department of Ag that is in place for an insecticide called TransTech which contains dinotefuron. In other states, this product has been approved only for Tree of Heaven, but for our state, the KDA was willing to open the emergency label to all of the potential host trees that this insect could attack, which includes white pines. So this is something that could be used by Christmas tree growers, uh, and it includes the other species as well. Uh, I won't promote it for people that are trying to grow maples for maple syrup production because then it's in the maple syrup but the other potential hosts that we would want to protect that are trees, we're going to be able to treat with this product. We're very excited that the KDA was willing to do that. The other thing that we're trying to get people prepped for is that people need to be ready for the impacts on their lives. I talked about some of the negative effects in your backyard, but I also want to point out that when this happens, when this pest arrives, life changes for the, the infested counties pretty quickly. Um, there are quarantines that get put in place in Pennsylvania, this is actually very strict. People that live there have permits on their, uh, on their rear view mirrors that tell inspectors where they're coming and going from. And your car is subject to inspection to see if there are lantern flies hiding in it or on it, or if they've laid their eggs in there. They do get up in the wheel wells frequently and will lay their eggs up there uh, while you're parked at work. And then you drive home and you could release them there. I actually, when we left the site in Indiana, we had to get up under the state vehicle and make sure that there were no eggs that had been laid on our wheel wells or underneath. Uh, it gets pretty intense. There's trainings that happen at facilities in infested areas where employees are taught what to look for and where. Uh, it gets very intense very quickly. And so this means that there are restrictions for people. I think we've seen over the last couple of years that people don't like restrictions. Uh, a lot of the times, and they don't like government intrusions in many cases, but this will be a case where there's not a lot of options. Uh, the government will get involved because otherwise we are unleashing a really bad bug on the state, and there will be restrictions on certain products. Uh, this is an expensive pest. Pennsylvania has done an economic study of it, and they believe that in the best case scenario, this is the best case, it's going to cost their state about $300 million. That's in treatments and removals and quarantines. It's also probably going to cost around 2,000 to 3,000 jobs. Uh, and those are people who will be laid off because quarantines impact an industry so much it's no longer profitable. Uh, there's restrictions on wood products. There's restrictions on nurseries. And there's going to be impacts on agriculture. And so all of that means that people get uh, busted in their, uh, their independent business or their farm goes up because they can't beat this bug. And so there's a lot of economic impacts that can happen with this. Things in Kentucky that will be impacted include our small hops industry, all of the vineyards that have popped up in the wake of the tobacco settlement money, uh, all of these different ag sectors where we grow trees in particular. So nursery tree production, Christmas tree production, and then the lumber industry. Uh, there, there are gonna be restrictions on products moving between different places. Uh, there's direct damage on plants. All of this adds up to an insect that will really change life for Kentuckians. And that's why we're monitoring so strongly for it, why we're starting that citizen science project. And we also encourage people, if they think they have seen one of these, to try to obtain it as a sample or at least get a photograph of it. It is an extremely distinctive looking insect. Uh, we have had people contact us and believe that they have seen it, but they've never been able to give us anything, like even a picture or a wing or a leg or anything of that nature. We need physical evidence because this would be an extraordinary claim 
and extraordinarily claims require extraordinary evidence. Uh, without it, we can't go to the federal government and get things verified. And if we can't do that, then the insect will just be able to persist and hide wherever it's at. So catch things, take pictures, uh, encourage the, the folks that you work with to do the same. There are some things that live here that look sort of similar, and I wanted to highlight a few of those. There's several moths that are often confused for the spotted lanternfly. Uh, if we start in the upper left-hand corner here uh, and go clockwise from there, this is the ornate bella moth. We have the pink underwing. We have the great leopard moth and then the uh, tin line sphinx moth. And I think you can see why people might confuse this for the lanternfly at first pass. There's that bright splash of pink on the back wings or red, just like we see with the lanternfly. There's dots or stripes or patterns, but all of these are either considerably smaller or considerably bigger than the lanternfly. Uh, there's also scales all over their body, like we see with most moths and butterflies. And so when you touch them, there'll be a powdery substance that gets on you. That doesn't happen with spotted lanternfly. Some close relatives of lanternfly that can kind of look similar include the harlequin bug in the upper left. This is a, a pest of a lot of crops in the garden, like broccoli and other things. Then we have milkweed bugs and box elder bugs. So they look similar in shape, but they're much smaller. Uh, they don't have the right color patterns. But again, you can see where people might see these and then sort of in the abstract or just in the quick view, think that maybe, oh, this is the best that I've been hearing about in the news a lot. So there are some ways to tell them apart. There are some options uh, for native species and hopefully we can help people with that. I appreciate the opportunity to talk with you today about this pest. I apologize, I'm kind of low energy. I'm actually uh, in quarantine for having COVID right now. So uh, I'm not at 100%, but I, I appreciate the chance to be with you uh, over Zoom. And I hope that uh, you haven't seen the lanternfly, but if you do, please let us know uh, and we can uh, try and help you out with that.